So this is a talk about scheme translation representations of generalized brains. So as with many talks, I have to spend first half an hour explaining what are all the words in the title of the talk. So the, somehow the most important one is actually what scheme. So let me explain where did that came from. So this this is a sort of very very nice representation uh, sort of representation theoretic story uh, at first. Geometry will come in slightly later, and this story starts with something ve very well known. So well known as to earn a Fields Medal for its inventor, and that's Jones polynomial. So this is around 1995, work of Von Jones. So what, what, what is Jones polynomial? It's a polynomial invariant of links, of oriented links. A polynomial invariant of oriented links. Inver so invariant means that uh, invariant under isotopy. So if you continuously change your oriented link, you still get uh, the same polynomial. Now I'm going to define it slightly differently. I mean, the original definition by Von Jones is actually very simple, but it uses a different kind of scheme relation. They're all sort of similar, but I, so I give a slightly uh, different definition by a Kaufman bracket, and that uh, will have just the sort of the, what is now known after the dust has settled on this as the scheme relation. So how does this work? Uh, we associate uh, a Laurent polynomial in one variable to every link. And we do this under the following rules. So, uh, a this sort of polynomial of what's called a not, which is a simple loop, is q plus q to the power of minus one, where q is our variable. And if you're sort of wondering why this is not one, in a sense, uh, your, your question will be justified in a moment. And the second sort of rule, which allows us to get, uh, to sort of slowly build up this polynomial for any given link, is if you have a disjoint product of two links, so uh, this is just a product of the polynomials for both of them individually. So two links don't interact with each other. Uh, you just multiply their polynomials. So um, th this together tells you that you can sort of take your link and start chucking out this uh, sort of simple loops out of it. But what if you're, but you know, if you think of a sort of a knot or a link, you think of sort of intersections. So uh, it turns out you just need one extra relation, one extra rule to, re to sort of to have this polynomial defined for every single sort of knot. And that is you now notice that I say oriented links. Actually, this polynomial I'm going to define right now doesn't see uh, the orientation. Orientation will come in useful in a second. So uh, now this is a bit of a shorthand. What, it's, what, this, what this statement means is the following. If I have a um, if I have a uh, complicated link, which somewhere in it has this intersection, then the polynomial associated to it is a sum of the polynomial associated to the same link. But where I replace this intersection with cap and cap minus my variable q times the polynomial of the same link where I replace it by these two guys. So if you think about it for a moment, that's it. Because every time you see, you see an intersection, you turn it into uh, 
you know, cup one way, so cup and cap one way and then cup and cap the other way. And uh, eventually after doing this a lot of time, all, a lot of times, all that will be left of your link is a bunch of unknots, of simple loops. And you sort of know, and the first tool tells you how to deal with that. So uh, this guy is called scale relation. The crossing is a sort of a difference scaled by our sort of variable, quantum variable uh, of this sort of, uh, these two, these two guys, um, actually, just a moment, let me see if I have a pointer here somewhere, I probably don't. So these two guys are often thought of as resolutions of this intersection. Now, uh, what, this, what this guy is, is, as I mentioned, a polynomial for, to every link, it associates all around polynomial in one variable. And this is not actually Jones polynomial, but this is called, uh, and this will be quite confusing, the scaled Kaufman bracket. The scale, because the original Kaufman bracket had actually value one uh, on unknot. So we essentially scaled it by Q plus Q minus one. It turns out that once you do that, you can really say that the uh, poly uh, polynomial of the two disjoint links is the product of the individual polynomials. So what do we do next? Uh, this is actually not a link, not a link invariant, meaning that uh, if uh, it is, not, you know, this, this construction depends on a particular planar projection of your link. And uh, the precise way in which it depends is that it's in very, uh, there is something called Reidemeister's mo moves. These moves are essentially allow you to turn sort of planar projections one into another. And if something is invariant under all Reidemeister moves, then it is independent of the planar projection of the link and, and defines the sort of isotic invariant of the link. So this is invariant, this guy is invariant under all the Reidemeister's moves except for Reidemeister one. Not uh, sorry. Um, it seems that uh, I thought I switched on to not disturb. Anyways, sorry, it seems some notifications are still getting through. My apologies in advance. I'll have to fix it next time. So this is not invariant, not invariant under. Write a master one. So what is really master one move? It's sort of a so-called untwist. Imagine if you wish this diagram, which involves a crossing. If this was a 3D link, or if we, you know, you can either think of this of sort of untwisting those two strands. Or you can think of sort of looking at it from a slightly different angle and projecting where you wouldn't see these two guys crossing each other. Either way, sort of this right master move turns this into this. So you, you sort of take these two guys and sort of untwist them. So in order to make our Kaufman uh, bracket um, a proper invariant of links, we apply scaling. And the scaling we apply, we define a new polynomial. Uh, where now for the scaling, we suddenly remember our link has orientation. We look at every single crossing and we denote by XL the number of sort of of crossings where you go from right to left over the strand which goes from left to right. And you denote as Y of L the number of crossings of the other. I mean, just, uh, it doesn't actually matter, of course, which one, just uh, choose parity on uh, crossings and count all the types. And then you scale your original 
uh, scale. This is this is the unfortunate uh, sort of business. You take a scaled Kaufman bracket and you further scale it. So the the original sort of scaled in the Kaufman bracket was to do with uh, having it behave under sort of disjoint union of links properly. This is this makes it into invariant of links. So you take minus one to the to x to the power of l, and then you take a variable q and raise it to the power of y l minus two x l. And then you take your Kaufman bracket. So this now is a link invariant. So this scaling, you know, it looks arbitrary, but you know, the formula is tinkered in precisely such a way as to make this uh, polynomial behave well under this untwist randomizer mode. And then uh, what you get is essentially practically the Jones polynomial, but we have to unscale original scaling we've applied to the Kaufman bracket. So let me explain this. So the Jones polynomial originally uh, was defined as the run polynomial in half power of variable p. So, um, take the Jones polynomial and change variable where you set p to the power of one half minus q. So, this will turn it into a one polynomial in q. Then, uh, what you get is take kl and divide it by q plus q minus one. So remember that uh, in the definition of scale Kaufman bracket, I defined that uh, the scale Kaufman bracket of an unknot to be q plus q minus one. Jones, Jones polynomial, Jones as well as Kaufman originally want their polynomial to be one of the unknot. So this sort of unscales back the scaling we've applied to Kaufman bracket in the beginning. But the moral of this story, I mean, the only thing you have to take out of this is. Um, all you need to construct this polynomial invariant of random links is, uh, you know, simple the simple one rule called skein relation, uh, because everything else is just uh, disjoint union of links should correspond to the product of polynomials, and you have to sort of to be equal to something on on not. So uh, why am I sort of uh, telling uh, about this on a seminar of uh, sort of algebraic geometry, because the story will very quickly uh, get geometrical, but before it gets geometrical, it will get harder. So, uh, next chapter in the story is so called Kovanov homology. A paper on the turn of the millennium that launched a thousand ships and a thousand other people's papers. So, this is about year 1999. The brainchild of Mikhail Khovanov. So what's this? Well, what it does, it lifts this from level of polynomials to the level of homology. So it lifts, so lifts the above. To the level of homology, it finds a complex whose coefficients, uh, whose sort of homology, cohomologies are essentially the coefficients in the uh, in the Jones polynomial. So, uh, so well, let if we start with link L. Then what Hovanov does is an extremely natural construction, which con constructs a complex which I'll denote C of L of graded R modules. So the resulting guy has two gradients graded where R is usually taken to be Z, but, but then can be taken as a sort of quantum 
uh, rim, so Z and one quantum variable. But the idea is that notice that there are two gradings here. One is the grading in the complex, and the other is grading in the, each element of the complex. So we have a bi-graded so, uh, structure. So this cons the construction Hovenov offers only works up to quasi-isomorphism. What does it mean? This means that he makes choices at many points uh, in his construction, but then shows that each of these choices, uh, when made differently, produces a quasi-isomorphic complex. So you do not get a canonical complex associated to a link, but you certainly get canonical sort of cohomology groups or homology groups. I mean, uh, I was once a proper card carrying algebraic geometer, so for me, those guys are always cohomology groups. So now I have bi-graded cohomology of my link uh, with uh, the indices tracking the two gradings in the original complex. So, uh, and that's what's called uh, Hovenov homology, you know. So how do we construct this complex? Well, it's the same idea. The complex we associate to the link is essentially constructed via a homological version of a skin relation. Uh, you postulate that the complex of a link with an intersection can be constructed as a cone of a complex of cup and cap, uh, which comes with a natural map with a comp with a complex of the same thing but with the different evolution of the crossing. So this is homological scheme relation. I mean. What really happens is that, uh, I mean, where does this, where, where do you ask this map comes from? Here, you really need to get into nitty gritty of the construction. He constructs a certain commutative cube uh, and then sort of choosing the ways to contract uh, to sort of uh, this cube uh, will give you sort of the choice of these maps and, and give you the various quasi isomorphic complexes depending on which order you do things. But uh, let's uh, not, not go there. The important thing is that, uh, once you do his construction, then it has this nice property. Uh, so what does this have to do with Jones polynomial? Well, Jones polynomial is just the Euler characteristic of, uh, of this cohomology theory. So the Jones polynomial can be recovered. as the Euler characteristic. Well, plus uh, a little bit of sort of, uh, you have to take indices and shake them up a bit. So in the case, when you're when you when the ring you're working on is that Z, if you compute by graded Euler characteristic of the complex, which is by definition sum of over O I and J, you take minus one to the power of I, you take Q to the power of J, so one variable tells you the sign, and then the other one grading and then the other grading tells you the power of and then the index of index of that is so uh, so inside uh, sort of uh, each well anyway so then this is just q plus q minus one times ah uh, times um, just a second 
Uh, yep. Uh, times the Jones polynomial. Note that this is precisely the scale polynomial we are, will obtain by sort of by scaling Kaufman bracket twice. So uh, the unscaling we applied to this and then to get the Jones polynomial is sort of is you shouldn't be doing this if you are uh, doing this kind of theorem. Right then. Uh, so now the geometry comes in. Because, you know, uh, when you see this kind of construction, you always start sort of wondering whether uh, there is some sort of natural construction on the level of complexes, uh, which uh, basically whether there is a derived category of something reasonable hiding behind this picture. So this is uh, a story of something known as categorification of a tang of tangle calculus. Tangle calculus. And this is Cautis and Kamnitzer in 2007. So the idea is that they want to take uh, links and sort of represent them as uh, as functors, uh, sort of on on the on geometry on geom on geometrical objects on derived categories of certain slices of flag varieties, uh, and it turns that then you sort of recover uh, the whole homology out of that. So if you are sort of Cautis and Kamnitzer, you were constructing geometric representation of tangle calculus. And uh, if you are sort of people uh, who were excited about uh, Hovnov homology, then what you've done is you've learned to compute Hovnov homology geometrically. So Hovnov homology, homology via, yeah, if you're wondering what on earth is representation of tangle calculus, I'll explain exactly. Uh, in a moment, what that is. So via constructing an option of tangle calculus Timothy? Yes. Sorry to disturb you, but sometimes it seems that you cover your microphone and it's really hard oh. to understand you. Oh, oh I see. Uh, I will, yeah, uh, I will have to make sure that I'm not holding the sort of uh, one side of an iPod. Right. Is this better now? Yeah, perfect. So Thank the you. tangle calculus acts on derived categories of certain slices. I will be very precise about this. Of cotangent, well, I'll be more precise about this. Of cotangent bundle of a flag variety in of flags in two n capital N dimensional space where n is large, so large that uh, it is bigger than any number of sort of, of crossings uh, that can happen in your uh, tangle in sort of in any one given sort of slice of it. Uh, again, you will see what I mean here in a moment. But then you take not, not just the full flag variety, but all the sort of partial flag varieties in that space as well. And so let me, uh, rather than here, one picture is sort of really definitely worth a thousand words. So let me try to represent uh, this little nice diagram I have in my notes in real time. So, First, let me draw a link. Ah, uh, sorry. So, like this, and then like this, and then like this, and like this, and like this. And like this, and then just like. So what's happening here? So what I've drawn here is a typical link. 
what Cloud is intending to tell you is that if you have a link, slice it up into Toggle. So Toggle is a slice of a link, something that allowed to have crossings, but allowed, allowed also to have this pops and caps. So this particular link, I'm going to slice up like this. So a representation of tangle calculus means that I should have each tangle, each tangle be a functor between a pair of derived categories. And that means that to each collection of points, in this case, just a number will do. I should associate a derived category. So if I have no points, this is derived category of vector spaces. Uh, this is really a derived category of a point and point is a sort of a, is a trivial flag variety it's a, a single flag in two-dimensional space uh, the trivial one so if i have two points then what i do is i take derived category of n n slot we slice and here i'm you know what i really do is i take a certain resolution of the slice the slice itself is uh, um, slice itself is singular and then I sort of resolve it in a certain way. But what I do is I take the cotangent bundle of flags into n, into n of this form, one dimensional space inside of two dimensional space. Right. Uh, so what is slot we slice? Uh, as is sort of well known, cotangent bundle uh, of a flag is a flag plus a new potent operator, uh, which sort of uh, preserves this flag. And uh, M, M means that this, uh, new, this new potent operator should be of M, M, Jordan block flag. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm still working with the whole flag variety, but in the cotangent part of it, in the, in the, in the direction of sort of cotangent vector, I only take certain directions, like one into certain new potent operators. So, from this, you can pretty much guess what the rest of it will be. This is going to be a derived category of uh, and then slowly slice of flags which are of form V1 inside V2 inside V3. So I'm really sort of struggling with this. So I'm taking now flags with four uh, sort of spaces in there. And here is the same because I have four points again. And here I'm back to your category of vector space. So now I should build functors between them. But this is sort of not too bad. I mean, I'll just sort of mention how this one will work. Um, what, what this, the way this basically works is that the functors are variations on a theme of a sort of forgetful functor, uh, which just forgets that you have something, uh, some parts in your flag. Uh, for example, over here, you can just uh, forget that you uh, had both of these spaces and then you just sort of mark downstairs. And here, you can forget about V3 and V4, and you will have two flags V1 inside V2. Uh, and, uh, but again, uh, the mechanics of building a functures between them is not, uh, is not sort of the point of this talk. Uh, however, uh, let me sort of, uh, so, let me sort of say that we see scale relation here again, because caps and caps are defined uh, by essentially, uh, so all, uh, we, we, we read this sort of from bottom to top. So cap, caps correspond to forgetful functions, caps are the right adjoint. And the only thing I have to tell you how to do is how to represent the crossing function. And well, this is, this is where we have a scale relation. In this circle. And it's the same scheme relation all over again. Only now, instead of being uh, uh, so now we, we simply say that the code of the functor we assign to cap compose functor we assign to cap. Observe that this is just you know, because we do this vertically, this is corresponds to a functor assigned to very familiar cap and cap tangle. And if you take the uh, 
not sure. As I told you, this guy is a right adjoint to this guy. So there is an adjunction for unit. Which maps this to identity. Which and this, of course, can be thought of as uh, this sort of the other resolution of the crossing. And this cone has to be the function assigned to the crossing. So we are saying again that a crossing is uh, a difference, but if in the original version it was genuinely a difference of two polynomials, now we are doing, we're, we're in a proper sort of uh, phonological world and we are taking a sort of a cone of a natural morphism between those two guys. So if you've ever sort of heard any of my talks before, or if you've run into this in, in your research, this means that this is a spherical twist. Spherical twist of functor f. Uh, sorry. And the whole point is that all the functors we assign to cups and caps are the forgetful uh, functors induced by forgetting certain parts of your uh, of your flag. They are essentially when you unwind this all become in P1 vibrations in one dimensional projective space P1. These are very well known uh, to sort of be these spherical functors. And the spherical functor is precisely a functor for which uh, the cone of its adjunction per unit is an auto equivalent. And of course, uh, this is an invertible tangle, so it has to be represented by auto equivalent. Right. So, uh, but what does this have to do with uh, of homology? Well, observe that if we now have the whole link. I can associate to it a functor which goes from vector spaces to vector spaces. And I associate it to it by simply slicing it up into basic tangles and then composing the corresponding functors. So in this case, uh, I do uh, sort of, unfortunately, I have to write this backwards. So this is the, uh, the last functor. Before that, we have a functor of crossing. And a cup. And this is actually a functor of crossing uh, followed by a functor of a cup, if my memory serves me. Uh, this, the way this is rigged, that if you do things into sort of two, two separate uh, Parts of your board, they, uh, they, the resulting functors commute. Uh, although, you know, don't quote me on that. This is definitely correct. I don't remember uh, the exact mechanics uh, of this. So let me not make any uh, outlandish statements. So then after this, I have this guy, which is the functor which corresponds to another basic tangle. And then finally, I have a functor which corresponds to these two guys. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, there is uh, there is an issue with uh, how to break this up into into a functor in sort of, uh, which corresponds to a crossing in a cup, but let let's not not go into this at the moment. But the whole point of the theory is that you obtain a functor from derived category of vector spaces to derived category of vector spaces. And Lyon's share of that paper is spent on showing that this functor does not depend on the way you've projected your uh, link onto a plane and then on the way you've sliced it up. So what this means is that you have to show that this construction is invariant under Rydermeister moves. So Tons of checking uh, that mm, sort of pairs of functors are isomorphic. But what you get is a, if you have a functor from vector spaces to vector spaces, you can apply it to a one dimensional vector space sitting in degree zero. So uh, this is, uh, sorry, 
So I take a functor FL and then I apply it to the basic generator of the derived category of vector space. Uh, what I obtain is complex. And yeah, I always mean graded vector spaces. Uh, so vect for me is, uh, I mean, I, I need a bi-graded theory. So vect for me is a complex of graded vector spaces. And finally, uh, the Hovner homology is up to, yeah, this is uh, where we shake up, we shake the indices up a bit. If you take H I J, so this is bi-complex, it has two gradings, grading in a complex and grading inside each of its vector spaces. And if I compute the corresponding cohomology theory, then this is just the Hovner homology of the same link, but sort of where you do the following thing to the indices. You know, you, you do H I plus J, J. This is Hovner homology of your link. So what you do is you recover Hovner homology. So <coughs> Just to quickly recap, you construct representation of these tangles on uh, on derived category of complete and partial flat varieties in this huge space, uh, but not on the whole category, but on this actually tiny slice of each of those varieties. Uh, and then you, uh, once you've obtained that representation, you each link will define a uh, Function from derived category of vector spaces to itself that is necessarily defined by single complex of vector spaces and just take its homology. So, a fact this is sort of where our research comes in. So, uh, the tangle calculus, the tangle calculus does not act. on the whole spaces. So if you take all cotangent directions, if you take all real potent operators, so uh, then, you, you know, this const not, nothing in this construction tells you I mean, is, is using the fact that you're doing on slot and slice of the same. You can, you can take this whole uh, network of functors and lift it up to, uh, and consider them as functors between uh, the whole uh, sort of uh, flat varieties. But the problem is then that this construction is no longer invariant on the Rader right master move. So it does not define an, uh, in sort of an option of, uh, of tangle calculus. It does not obey the relations. Uh, so, Natural question to ask, question, what does? In other words, is there a more complicated structure which acts on whole sort of uh, complete and partial, uh, complete and partial flood varieties, which when you restrict it to the n and slot of the slice of H simplifies the tangle calculus. And uh, sort of, if you're wondering why on earth sort of do we go out looking for that, because in our in our case, so in our research, it's sort of the, the logic was sort of backwards. We uh, first came in, in the contact with parts of this structure which I'm about to describe, uh, and then uh, sort of try to understand what is the proper way to describe this structure. In fact, anybody uh, to any geometers here, if you've uh, worked with sort of three-dimensional and higher-dimensional slopes, if you've read sort of uh, papers by Wins and Donovan or by Bondo and Bogenta, which sort of study the, study the sort of the functors uh, uh, and semi-phobic depositions arising there, you've also ran into this structure. So uh, let me now define a structure which I claim does act uh, on the whole uh, sort of on whole flat varieties and then simplifies the tangle calculus in the slot of the slices. So that's so I've 
hopefully explain what skein in skein triangulator to the stations of generalized braids uh, means. Now I'll explain what are generalized generalized braids. So unfortunately, the generalized braids do not form a group. Uh, much like the tangle calculus, they form a category because tangle calculus has sort of cups and caps which are not invertible, and these braids will also have braids which are not invertible. So what is generalized? Braid category. G B R N. So B R N is what braid group is usually denoted as braid braids on N strands, and we will be defining generalized braids in, on N strands. So you know how do you find uh, a category? You tell people what objects and morphisms are. So objects are ordered partitions, partitions of N. Of N. So these are sort of whole sets of numbers which add up to N. Collections of numbers which add up to them sort of with an ordering. The way to think about it is that if you have an ordinary braid group, then each of your braids goes from n fixed endpoints to n fixed endpoints and looks something like this. Or, you know, it can be something slightly more complicated here. The intuition for more, the intuition for morphisms in our category. So uh, I'll explain why did I draw this picture in just a second. So morphisms are generalized braids. Uh, so ordinary braid group sits inside this braid category as uh, the uh, sort of monoid uh, associated to the object, which is the you know, a splitting up of n into all ones, which corresponds to this picture. But generalized braids, the main intuition, I mean, I'll do, I'll, I'll sort of give two definitions. One intuitively, which is completely useless definition, but actually tells you all uh, that you need to know about these guys uh, without having to technically work with them. These are brains where strands are allowed to touch. So one of the main thing in definition of the of the uh, braid category is that strands are not allowed to touch. They're allowed to pass over each other or to pass under each other. But we allow the strands to sort of to join and run together, sort of uh, overlapping. And this is why our objects are ordered partitions of N. Because now that we no longer demand our strands to be separate all the time, we must allow starting and endpoint configurations where you have roughly, roughly this is a typical example of generalized braid. So, so here the braid, these two guys start overlapping, they are sort of glued to each other, then it splits and joins with this one. And this gives you a morphism between to one, and well, sorry, we go from bottom to top, so from one, two, 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 one in our category. So how to define this rigorously? Because this, of course, is not a proper definition by any means. Well, right, here we go. Uh, A generalized braid is an oriented trivalent graph. So trivalent because the extraordinary behavior that we allow is we allow a strand, a multiple strand to split uh, or join 
and we allow to do we allow them to do um, this only sort of two at a time. So each strand can either multiple strand can split into two strands or any two sort of strands can join into a bigger strand. So that's why trivalent. So the information as to how many strands um, how many strands are within sort of one multiple strand is just coloring of the edges. Color by integers from one to n. So edge with three over it says that uh, you know there are three sort of strands in this thick strand. So, but you also need start points and end points. So in between the start points and the end points, uh, you are allowed only to have sort of trivalent points, but you also have some one valent uh, start point vertices. Which form a partition of them? Meaning that the valence is, uh, meaning that the uh, one valence start point vertices, uh, each vertex has an edge coming out of it. Edge is colored by a number from one to n. Uh, and this, all the, all the numbers uh, coloring all the edges coming out of all start point vertices add up to n. Similarly, uh, some one valent endpoint vertices which also um, form a partition of n. So how should I sort of, so if you have a picture which you think of it as this, which I drew before, Then the graph corresponding to this looks like this. We have two ones, then this two splits into one and one, and then this continues. Then this here continues, these two join. So this is how to sort of go from this from these graphs to the sort of idea of a braid uh, braid with the strands allowing to touch and backwards. So these are the start point vertices. These are end point vertices. And there are two trivalent vertices in between. And uh, Trivalent uh, graph should, you know, respecting flow. Thing. So, res so trivalent respects flow conditions. So, flow conditions means that if you have a trivalent vertices with two in and one out, then the coloring uh, of the out edge is the sum of the colorings of the in edge and, and vice versa. So, but you do not just have this graph, you need to consider it together with the planar embedding. So, all the diagrams I uh, draw here are planar, and we want therefore to consider this with embedding. Into. R2 times an interval from zero to one such that start points lie at height zero. So, uh, sorry, I don't mean, yeah, not planar embedding, of course, three-dimensional uh, space embedding lie, lie at R2, zero. So I need this graph together with some geometry, of course. End point lie at R2, one, and orientation maps positively, projects positively onto zero, one. Meaning we're not allowed to loop, to ever loop back. We sort of flow along uh, the graph from level zero to level one. 
low cups or caps. Onto our interval zero one. So now uh, these guys, as usual with these braids, are considered up to isotopies. So considered up to two things. Isotopies of embedded graphs and um, something called multi-fork relation. If you have if you have this situation you have p plus q plus r strand which splits into p and q plus r and then further splits into q and r this is the same thing this is why we only allow them to split two at a time because the sort of the uh, all the sort of bigger splittings uh, what it means is that the order essentially doesn't matter in this splitting. That means the same as the first split of R and P plus Q. And then you split this into P and Q. So this is called multi-fork. And that tells you that if you if you have a big multiple strand, it doesn't, and then there is an, it's analog for the merges. You know, just turn this picture upside down. Uh, what this tells you is it doesn't matter which order they split off strands and only thing that matters is the configuration in the end. So what the valence you've started with and the valence you've split it into whether it's order or not. Right. So the composition is given by concatenation and scaling because you know we need to start point and end points in terms of level zero and level one. So we sort of concatenate two of these guys and then squash the other thing by half. And uh, we also uh, want, uh, and the identity uh, element is, of course, just a bunch of vertical lines. Right, so example. So it turns out that this category has very simple sort of collection of generators. So let's see what GBR2 is like. So ordinary brain group on two strands is not very exciting. It's a sort of group generated by uh, a single element uh, sort of uh, which is the uh, which is a crossing of one strand over the other so what happens to generalized brains so gbr2 has two objects you know your two strands are either running together or they're running separately. And all morphisms are generated by four types of things. You have a basic fork which splits this is what's called F112, a fork which splits two double strand into two single strands. You have its opposite, the merge, which goes for which merges two strands into a single strand. Multiplicity two. And then you have our familiar friends, the crossings. So over crossing, and under crossing. Crossings. In particular, indeed, the full, the brain, ordinary brain, uh, uh, group sits as an endomorphism of, of this object at this frequency. This turns out to be completely general. GBRN is also generated by all possible forks, 
all possible uh, mergers and all possible sort of crossings with other platforms which we can think of. So this allows us to make a definition of what is a representation of generalized brain, which is sort of uh, already involves some non trivial mathematics, but is pretty useful. So a weak categorical representation representation of generalized braid category is uh, a functor uh, from this category to the category of categories up to um, isomorphism of functors. The objects are categories and uh, the morphisms are sort of functors, isomorphism classes of uh, functors. In other words, any, any partition of N, uh, you map into category CI. And uh, every generalized braid. which runs from some sort of start point configuration M to end point configuration L is a functor from uh, uh, sort of corresponding to this braid, which goes um, from uh, CM to CL. Uh, in a, but since all the uh, all the braids, all the morphisms in the, in the generalized braid category are generated by forks, merges, and crossings, then it is a collection uh, instead of uh, this, you have a collection of fork functors. Um, for every possible fork, merge functors. For every possible, uh, let me call them G. For every possible merge and uh, crossing functors. Uh, of two types. T L M and D L M for over crossings and under crossings, uh, which satisfy satisfy generalized braid relations. So ordinary braid relations uh, come from the fact that if you want to define an action of a braid group, which is generated by crossing, we simply uh, assign a functor or uh, an element to each uh, of your algebraic structure to each crossing and then they have to satisfy the braid relations which are relations between crossing functors so these are not these braid, these generalized braid relations are not a great deal sort of more complicated uh, than ordinary braid relations but sort of you know there is uh, I, I mean there is no uh, point in wasting time in writing a list of those since this somehow turns out to not be the right idea. Because let's go back now. Um, how did Hovnak homology, how did sort of Jones polynomial, how did the representation of tangle calculus by Countess and Kamitzer work? Uh, it always worked in the same way. We defined cups and caps, which in our case are forks and merge functors. And then we defined crossings using a skin relationship from forks and merge. So ideally, instead of sort of proving this uh, sort of braid relations, what we want to do is sort of, you can ask a question. 
What are analogs of skin relations? So this means that uh, what I'm looking for is uh, a sort of a set of relations which would allow me to compute crossing functions for fork and merge functions. And ideally, a sort of uh, a, uh, uh, I would be able to, to the end. Uh, one of them is that merge functions in all these theories are all the sort of uh, right uh, adjoints of your fork function. So, or left adjoints, but it doesn't matter sort of which way you build this theory. So, merge functions are thing just as adjoints. So, then if you write uh, a sort of a relation which uh, relates crossings to uh, forks and merges via some sort of uh, triangulated structure, like taking code, then you obtain a sort of a triangulated skin relations which can, which can be used to define representation of generalized braids uh, by only specifying fork functors. Let me give an example. Before sort of uh, telling you where this all comes from, uh, let me sort of give you a quick example. Uh, definition. So we, so this is work in progress. Uh, this is all joint work with Rina Anna of, uh, sort of uh, this should have been mentioned in the beginning, joint with, Anna. And uh, we do not yet have a full answer uh, to this question, although we're getting sort of uh, closer and closer. We have the answer to GBR2 and GBR3, and we have a fairly now good idea of what the answer should be in the general case, but it's a matter of, of precisely formulating it and then proving it. So let me tell you what a category that a categorical representation of GBR2 is scheme triangulated. If, well, first of all, all our all the categories which represent uh, all categories which represent our partitions of unity are triangulated categories. Two, um, I ask for the merge. Remember that uh, GBR2 is, is generated by um, for a single fork, a single merge, and two crossings. So uh, the fork is the left adjoint of the merge. I mean, we we used to work with it being right agent before, but for technical reasons, we needed to sort of to define it to be left agent. And finally, cru and crucially, uh, we need we define the crossing. Notice that we need strictly speaking, to define one crossing because the other is its inverse, is the code from, because we're working with left adjoints, it's now the adjunction unit from identity uh, braid from one, one to one, one. And this is of course, very well known for our well known for Two, a composition of F, Two one one G one one two. And what what is this? Well, um, we first go from uh, so
So we merge and then we split. So in a sense, you know, if you, so this is again the good old spin relation. Because in our case, cups and caps are replaced, you know, this is an analog of this guy. Right. Uh, so it seems when you review this all that uh, so what is uh, so what is the data of a what is then the data of a um, of, uh, scheme translate representation of GBR two? I need a category C one one C two. I need a translated category. I need a category C one one. Uh, I need a functor f to one one going this way. I need its adjoint. So maybe for the purposes of this, it's uh, this best to be right, I think. So and this should be the other way around. Uh, uh, so. So this should be um, uh, G1. This is a merge, and uh, merge is a right adjoint. So I want um, F112 G211. And uh, just to give it a fami uh, familiar thing. So we are asking for a functor with a right adjoint between two categories, and we are asking for the cone of that junction or unit to be autoequivalence. Uh, so a representation, I mean, again, if you know anything about circle functors, what I just told you is that a representation, well, almost, a representation of GBR2 is simply the data of a spherical function. Almost, because in order for this to be completely true, I need to add a fourth condition, which says that a cone from an identity rate of the 2-2 to uh, the composition of G and F in the in the opposite direction is also a not equivalence. So this, uh, so you really, if you add this, then this is a precise statement. So it seems that the that the scheme for related conditions should be the well familiar scheme relation. And the second set of, we should have a second scheme relation, which means demands for this cone in another direction to also be invertible. So, sorry, uh, I seem to be badly running out of time. Could somebody tell me, uh, you know, uh, for how long more I can go on? Uh, minus five minutes is a perfectly reasonable answer. I mean, I guess you can talk for 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, good. Be okay? Yes, because. Uh, this means I cannot sort of I'll skip a great deal of detail, but um, let me then. So the main two results I wanted to talk about, in which I sort of uh, run out of time uh, to fully talk about, is firstly there is a theorem by Ed Siegel, a very nice theorem which was sort of very surprising to some people, satisfying to others, is that it tells you that any what equivalence from a triangulated category? Well, of and I mean and everything. I mean, in order to take to to, to form cones of functors, you need to be working in DG enhanced or sort of infinity stable infinity one sort of enhanced uh, triangulated categories. Uh, 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 so, but if you have an equivalence of an enhanced triangulated category, then it can always 
if you read me as a spherical twist. As a spherical twist. So let me translate this into the language which I've just introduced. What Ed told us is that any categorical triangulated categorical representation of braid group on two strands, because what is a braid group on two strands? It's just a single invertible uh, braid. So categorical representation of BR2 is just a single autoequivalence. Extends to a skin triangulated representation of GBR2 to a spherical quantity. So this is an autoequivalence, and this is a spherical quantity. So uh, a theorem by Rina and myself, which surprised us a great deal. Is that this is true for any M, any triangulated categorical representation of BRM? What is this? This is just a collection of braided auto equivalences. And everything is, of course, enhanced. Uh, um, Arms, triangulated categorical rotation of BRM. And this is a collection uh, T1, Tm of braiding a category T plus a collection T of C of braiding auto equivalences. So this can be extended. to a skin triangulated representation of GBRM. So uh, when I say skin triangulated, it's a bit of a cheating. We don't really have a general definition of skin triangulated uh, representation. Well, we do not yet have a definition of skin triangulated representation for M greater than three. But whatever the definition is, this uh, construction we have uh, is uh, sort of is going to satisfy that quite clearly. I mean, in fact, we are using uh, this and a certain other representation, which we know to be skin triangulated as our sort of two polar, polar opposite sets of data to interpolate the general definition from. So, and, the, and what this is, is a sort of, it's a, a, a categorical, Categorical Neil Hecke algebra algebra over the original category C. So, if you think of original category C as a base field, then you sort of uh, you think of your uh, n odd equivalents as a sort of variables over that, and uh, then you simply impose you sort of you work purely formally you impose uh, Neil Hecke relations on them and. This is the same, and the, and the collection of uh, that new categorical new Hecke algebra and a, a, a number of its canonical subalgebras will give you uh, a skin translated representation which lifts the original bunch of braided braiding water equivalences. Uh, again, uh, I'm very sorry for running out of time because I could have um, explained this in detail, which would have made clear what sort of why why this categorical new Hecke. So, and the other. So I mentioned that uh, we have another example of uh, uh, what should be a skin triangulated representation of generalized braids. And this is the original sort of example which we have been working on for over 10 years now and which we are now slowly getting close to proving it. So here's, here's a conjecture. There is 
a categorical a categorical representation of GBRN where well for any partition of N I should tell you what the category is and this is what I hinted at in the beginning this is derived category of the cotangent bundle of flux in N space of partial flux of type corresponding to that partition what do I mean type corresponding to that partition well flux flux of this partial type so I'll finish once I once I finish stating this conjecture. So I'm almost done. So this is merely flux of type zero. We take a we take a subspace of dimension m1. Then we take a subspace of dimension m1 plus m2, and so on and so on until we arrive to a subspace of dimension m1 plus plus m k, which is our this is just equals to m. And the space of dimension n is just cn. So, just to give you uh, n dimension of vi equals i. So, just to give you an idea for uh, for this kind of calculus, uh, if you have one a partition like this, this corresponds to p3. So the partition one and three corresponds to p3. Why? Because the first space is space one. And then the second space is already uh, C4. So we, we are considering flux of one dimensional subspace in C4, which is P3. And of course, if you do this, one, 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 then you will get a full uh, sort of flux, uh, flux in four space because you know all the subspaces are present. Right. So I so basically I uh, my uh, my objects uh, in this representation. Objects of the generalized braid category are represented by derived categories of all partial, all types of partial flux and in uh, uh, n space. So, how do I construct fork functors? Well, my fork functor, like this, uh, is defined by a the following situation. Uh, I have, if I can, if I can fork endpoint configuration M into endpoint configuration L, this means that I have a functor from sort of L flux going to M flux, which is forgetful functor. Uh, so this is sort of really important because roughly these two configurations in order for this to be forked into this are completely identical. Only here I would have sort of uh, V I V I plus P plus Q. And then whatever. And here this corresponds to uh, P plus Q being present somewhere in my configuration. And here I would have VI in VI plus P in VI plus P plus Q, and then so on. So this is a fork where P plus Q is split into P and Q. So this generates one extra subspace in my partial flag and I can simply forget it. Uh, so what I then have is I have the following story. I have the tangent space, cotangent bundle, to this smaller flux. I have a Grassmannian of P, Grassmannian of uh, P in P plus Q space bundle over it, and then this embeds into. Uh, with, with the same co-dimension as is the dimension of this Grassmannian into FLM of L. And this space is, if I denote this forgetful map by phi, then what this is, is uh, the pullback to this space of the cotangent bundle of this space. So this is a bit of a standard construction, which 
this is a standard analog of a, of a sort of of a forgetful uh, uh, functor when you deal with this cotangent bundles. You don't have a single map, you have this sort of ladder. And if this is projection P and this is I, then my functor, which corresponds to uh, this fork, is simply uh, pull back along this Grassmannian fibration and then push forward along this closed embedding. Uh, well, then the corresponding merge is just going to be right adjoint. Right adjoint. Of, of, of course, of, uh, well, of a fork going the other way. And finally, every crossing is the convolution of a Ricard complex. Of, a, of V, A, I mean, there are many Ricard complexes. So I, this is the only thing I have to explain before, uh, very quickly, before I finish. So Ricard complex uh, in F and G's. So before, my single crossing was a cone from a composition of F and G into identity. In general, the re, you know, Jeremy Ricard was do, doing purely representational theoretical work, but there he came up with this sort of strange collection of uh, complexes of objects, which was then picked up by Kautis and Kamnitzer and Likata uh, and uh, made into a certain uh, with a, a certain complex of this of these braids, and then you know convolution of a big complex uh, is like uh, in a, is in a, a convolution of a uh, of a morphism of two functors is the cone of that morphism. A convolution of a complex of functors uh, is just a generalization generalization of that. So this tells you that you should be able to build uh, as 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 before. You should be able to build the so build uh, the crossings out of forks and merges. So these are certainly skein relations. Uh, and this was, this, it is sort of trying to prove this, uh, that we've uh, sort of been working on for about 10 years studying spherical PN uh, functors and so on. And the amazing thing is that, why do I say that this is a polar, this example, um, with the categorical new hack is a polar opposite of this one. Because, and then I'll sort of have just to stop here. Uh, this categorical new hack algebra is a sort of, is a degeneration of this story where you uh, sort of artificially make uh, all the, uh, you sort of, you turn uh, all the differentials in this sort of complexes morphism between these guys to zeros, basically. So, uh, in a certain sense, uh, uh, this is uh, this picture is a degenerate. I mean, even in, in this situation, you can just take. Uh, so, this statement in particular tells you that if you if you do this for uh, you can, you can obtain a bunch of braided auto-equivalences by just considering the image of the ordinary braid group sitting inside that. If you apply our construction to this, you do not recover this picture. You discover it, you, you, you recover its certain degeneration. And this degeneration is a very different set of uh, cane triangulated relations. And between, by analyzing both the relations between the uh, between our functors here and here, we are now very close to finally and sort of give, uh, giving a very general definition of what a skin, of what are sort of, of what a skin triangulated representation of generalized braid group is. So I'd like to finish here. I'm very sorry for overrunning.